you know, if I'm going to do cat power rankings, then, then he's the winner. Okay, uh, so we left off with, uh, we're in chapter 11, I do believe. Uh, yeah, something like that. We're almost to the end, and then I can stop reading books and go back to... Go oh, back to what? We're only, go we're like, we're 10 pages what? from the end of the book. Nice. So, there you go. Lauren Burns stands in line with the rest of them. Though she is not convinced that this is the right way to get people off their ecology. She knows how close she came to death on level 48 and she's very grateful for the help that her police force get, got from unexpected allies. She's amazed she wasn't killed by any of the hundreds of shots that were fired across the densely populated level. There's a man ahead of Lauren who is sweating heavily. Instinctively she backs away from him, allowing people to get in front of her. Maybe she's paranoid. She would tell nearby security officers of her concern, but they would likely brush her off as having post-traumatic stress. Lord knew she had a lot of that anyway, but this one man among the crowd had frightened her. She's relatively certain she was not exposed to whatever experiment the enemy was running. She has no idea. The problem is, the infection set to work as a time bomb. Anyone in this crowd could be infected, and they're all being sent home to Earth. She's only grateful the infection's not contagious, at least as far as she's heard. Scares her how quickly she has been demoted from a section leader to a nobody. She has already been told where on earth she'll be located, as there's a limited space for her there. The area she lived in before moving into Arcology 1237 is now full, and she's not allowed to return to be alongside her family and friends. She has no clue where life goes from here, but it seems very wrong uh, to her that she's being treated like uh, cattle. There might be a way back if she's smart, if she can get lost in the chaos... She has the uneasy feeling she has to find a way out and fast. This is all supposed to be over, but she's starting to wonder if it'll ever be over. Could someone experience after effects weeks, months, or years after being infected? Maybe no one's truly immune, just slower to show symptoms of the insanity. This all leaves Lauren's head spinning. Maybe she is insane. Her head continues to spin as she hears someone scream behind the man who is making her nervous. She's lost in her thoughts and uncertain of what's happening around her. It's overload. The explosion tears through the room and the heat from the blast catches Lauren's face just as she tries to shield herself. She feels her hair being singed by a fireball emanating from the spot where that man stood only a minute ago. Uh, screams fill the room even as the explosion echoes through the entire level. Security personnel struggle to deal with this sudden chaos. Lauren dives for the floor and... Here's a kid near her crying. She reaches out in the direction of the crying child. She grabs a tiny hand and pulls a little boy to her chest as she then crawls through the exit. Her hair's been singed and the smell of her burnt hair is enough to make her sick, though she manages to keep focused on the goal at, at hand at this moment. The elevator's nearby, but it's still down due to Mike Translow's attack on it earlier. Lauren instead carries the child to the nearby stairway. She starts climbing up and becomes aware she's crying. People are following behind her. Apparently, she's become a leader again. On her way up the stairs, she finds John Webster on his way down, with his forces closed behind. What the hell was that, he asks. Some crazed lunatic was a human bomb down there. Apparently, he blasted himself to Kingdom Come and took others with him. I barely escaped with my life. Uh, for the second time today, she explains, trying to remain as po calm as possible under the circumstances. Okay, we'll hand it from here. handle it from here, Nathan says, and he takes the lead as others make their way down the stairwell. John and Catherine... Stay with Lauren and the young boy. One uh, Lauren finally looks at who appears to be older than, no older than three. Who's that? Catherine asks. I grabbed him in the confusion and got him out of there, she says. There you are, a woman yells. She reaches out and grabs the child from Lauren's arms. Thank you for helping, the woman says. Lauren nods towards the woman. Can't find any words to say, though. She looks at John. I thought this was a bad idea. The infection's still here. It just takes longer to show up in some people. I don't know what we're going to do. We'll figure all this out, John says, and he embraces Lauren for a moment. This is just the beginning. Trust me on this. She shudders. That's what I'm afraid of. So that's where we'll end it for today. We'll... Okay. All right. Arcology 652 was completely wiped clean. There was nothing alive there when the door was opened. Jimmy Webster had signed up for the job, but he wasn't happy about it. He had visions of following in the footsteps of his older brother, John, but this seemed like a terrible first assignment to have. The Arcology was a thriving city in space and became lifeless in, in, in space, much like 443 after it. The question became one of why 652 didn't get the attention from the media. 
652 only came out because of the information passed on to them by Mike Translow. There had to be something here that Altel had hidden from them. Jimmy was the one who had the unenviable job of leading a team into the dead zone. Now there was a sudden urgent need to find out what happened here. Arcology 652 had striking differences in relation to the state 443 was found in. Here there's no sign of mass suicides, only of mass genocide. Jimmy's sick to his stomach in the midst of uh, the scene and suddenly finds, and he suddenly thinks following in his big brother's footsteps might be a little overrated. There are also marks on the necks of these victims where he has to inspect more closely. At his partner is Andrea Blaine. Andrea's new to this kind of work as well. Joining the special forces is a way to make money in an age where jobs are almost as difficult to hold on to as livable space. She hasn't been able to process what happened here. She does, however, manage to take some readings of the air in the room. It's a low oxygen level. That only happens if plant life's been destroyed in the agricultural levels. Even then, with no one breathing the air, levels should have stayed the same. They blew the air out of the area to kill them. It's the same method they used on 443. But the puncture marks are consistent with drawing blood. The hell were they drawing blood for? I thought they were all spreading, all about spreading disease, not about research, he says as he looks over each victim and finds evidence that they that each and every one of them had blood drawn. Uh, they must really want to know what makes us tick. They did have plans to kill us all, she points out. I'm sure they still do. That's why we were sent here, Jimmy reminds her. There's a lot of research to do at this crime scene. I'm not picking up any life readings at all in the ship. Everything's dead here. So what do we tell headquarters, she asks. We tell Dave we're working on it. Maybe you could let him know we need a medical team up here for more sample taking and let him know the area is safe by all appearances for cleanup efforts to begin. She sighs. Why do I have to call Dave? Uh, my first name comes after yours in the alphabet. That makes it protocol for you to call Dave, he says with a wink. At least make up something believable, she says. But she does head back to the shuttle and does start the process of calling headquarters to tell them of the devastation they've found. Jimmy finds an electronic device on the floor. He isn't sure what catches his eyes about this particular device, but it's one that takes that Jimmy has at home as well. It's used for video diaries and documenting trips, special occasions and the like. This appears to have been placed on the floor, sitting upright as if it wants to be found. There's a conflict within Jimmy about this. Is it a private recording? Should he be viewing something like this among the carnage? It could be viewed as a time waster when he could be doing other further investigation of this. He isn't even consciously aware he's turned on the device when a 3D image of, an, of a woman appears before him. I really hope someone finds this, the young woman says quietly. Her face is drawn and her eyes are bloodshot. Her hair is matted and she appears to be suffering from starvation. My name is Jen, Jane, Jenny Keenan. I am 22 years old and I'm the last survivor on this arcology. I've been living off of whatever food I can find, but they destroyed most of it when they left. Aliens killed us all. I know this sounds crazy, but they did. This whole thing has been crazy. I found the video recorder in someone else's pocket. This isn't even mine. I want someone to find this and know what happened. I heard the leader of these ugly-ass aliens talking, and I guess we're a test site for something. I saw one guy go completely insane after they shot him with something. I don't know what they intend to do with that. I don't want to know. They never found me. When the killing happened, I hid in the vents. It's weird because that's where they traveled when they got here. That's how we didn't see them. I guess they paid some jerk in first class off, and he let them in through, in through service paths. They really need to redesign these, these damn things. I've seen some horrible things, and now I'm alone. I can tell you what I know. Their leader spoke of some great plan they have to wipe humanity out. They also want to have a way to create humans just from strands of DNA or something like that. I had a hard time hearing whether he said they wanted to create a master race or be the master race, I wasn't going to ask him to repeat it from my hiding spot either. She pauses and looks back over her shoulder. There's a chance here for me. Well, I, I think there is anyways. These places have pods used to send packages to Earth. I know they're not built for human habitation. That reminds me. Someone needs to get escape, escape pods for these stupid things. Like you have a half a million dead people up here, in part because there's no way to escape. I guess we get arrogant and don't figure we need that stuff. It's just like that old ship without life bolts that sank in the Atlantic. I, I don't know. I'm just babbling. Anyway, Earth has a lot of water on it, so I figure if I aim this pod back there for water, I should survive the landing. Well, I hope so, anyway. The only other piece of important information I have is they say there was a legend. There was a legend that a human had once been chosen. I didn't hear the rest of it, and I have no clue what the hell that means. Again, I couldn't ask them to clarify what human was chosen for or how. To whoever finds this, there was a lot of good people here. 
This was really needless. So many were suffocated when those pricks took the air out of most of this place for their own amusement. They do this crap for fun. These aliens are sick on a level that should scare everyone. It's not going to stop here. They were already talking about other arcologies and how they wanted to erase humanity from the universe. They were so casual about killing so many people as if they were, as if they were mere cattle at the slaughterhouse. She visibly shudders. That's what this place is now, a slaughterhouse. I'll never forgive myself for being unable to find a way to contact the outside world. They blocked all outgoing signals somehow and almost turned the power off when they feared they were losing control of the situation. The lights were out for a day or so and then came back uh, when they had everyone here dead. Well, I don't know how much battery life this thing has, so we'll stop now. I pray someone finds this and that the aliens who are responsible for this, uh, this suffer greatly before they die themselves. I'm not a violent person, but I will, would have killed every one of those ugly buggers where they stood if I could have. I tried to get surveillance footage for proof of what they did, but they destroyed all of it. They were thorough, and they were slick. She looks over her shoulder towards the pod. I guess I better go. God, what if this doesn't work, she asks herself. I guess this will be the last thing. If I, I do if it does crash horribly, then. This is Jenny Keenan signing off, she says, and the video image fades away. Andrea steps towards Jimmy, having come out of the shuttle near the end of that recording. She heard enough to know it's important find. So where did she go, Andrea asks, as she looks towards the hatch that led to the pod Jenny must have taken to Earth. Jimmy sighs as he moves towards the hatch. To my knowledge, no humans ever tried traveling in one of those pods. Girl made some good points here. I, never, I, I guess we never figured on aliens trying to kill everyone on an arcology. This didn't, se didn't seem like a likely possibility. Now, everything's changed and apparently we're at war as a planet. Scary as it gets, Andrea says, looking Jimmy in the eye. Jimmy hasn't known Andrea for a long time, but he likes her no-nonsense way of doing things. He tends to be a little scatterbrained, so having someone around who's reasonable is a good thing. His brother John was always good for that. He sometimes misses small details as he rushes to get the task completed. Uh, she also has the beautiful long hair and blue eyes, but he doesn't have time to think about that. He checks out the coordinates that read on the hatch to which the pod had once been attached. It says here the pod was ejected from the arcology over two months ago. It was aimed at the Pacific Ocean. I can't, I can't see it burning up on reentry, but I can't see Earth's radar figuring it to be anything but space debris since, I, since we have so much of that crap falling on, in the atmosphere every day. Since she can't drink ocean water, I hope she managed to find land quickly. Andrea looks up the coordinates. The pod states it was it sent the pod. Yeah, that's that's really worded badly. Andrea looks up the coordinates that it was supposedly sent to. She shrugs. Well, there's an island near there. Do we hunt for this girl or get Dave to send a squad to look? He's sending a team here to investigate things further. He wasn't impressed you didn't call him yourself. Yeah, I'll get right on that, Jimmy says, rolling his eyes as he heads for their shuttle. I guess uh, our stay here will be a short one. The cleanup crew can get things done. If there is a survivor in this disaster, we have to talk to her and get any information we can from her. That legend talk was weird, Andrea says. I don't believe in legends. Not much of a mystic about anything, really. My brothers and I are in agreement about that. Might be the only thing we do agree on, Jimmy says with a smirk. So you won't go with me to the church then, she asks sarcastically. It'll likely catch on fire just from my mere presence, so it's not advisable unless you really don't like your church, he says as he starts to shuttle up and they head back towards Earth. Chapter thirteen. You sure you want to? You sure you want to go through? Because that's up to the end of chapter twelve. Okay. And it's chapter chapter thirteen. See, thirteen follows twelve. Really? Just so you know. Does it? Just as an FYI. The bear's looking at me like, is he serious? This Hi. Guys, a moron. What? What's your problem? Hi. What's up with you? Hi. Can you stop glaring at me? Thank you. All right, uh, Mike Translow has always been a step ahead of the game. The trick is to make sure no one knows you're a step ahead of the game, and in this case, even his wife wasn't aware he was a step ahead. It's In matters as important as this, there had always been a backup plan. As nice as running the planet's military would have been, this option was slightly, only slightly less attractive to him. Katie has no clear where they're going. She's learned over time not to question him and just sit back and enjoy the ride. He hasn't let her down thus far, so her trust... Uh, so so she trusts he will be right here as well. Her heart's racing because of the ship they're in, one she's never laid eyes on before. This ship kicks a lot of ass, Mike says as he pilots the SS-210 off the landing strip. 
He's had the ship hiding under a simple tarp at the spaceport for months now. The SS-210 is the latest personal craft, and it is fitted with weapons that no one outside of the ship would be aware of. Falteris has a strong armed forces, but in terms of spaceships uh, that are armed and capable of handling themselves in the void between worlds, they're sorely lacking. The SS-210 would be per per perceived as a violation of a peace treaty Mike never agreed with between his world and Altel. That agreement made it illegal to build spaceships capable of firing weapons. The agreement was in place as Altel claimed they didn't want craft capable of firing in deep space either. In his travels, Mike had seen Altillian, the Altillians destroy enemy ships in the vast emptiness between worlds, not to mention those he had seen inside the air ecology near Earth. Space battles were eerie in that there was no noise unless your ship was directly hit. No sound without air to conduct it. See? Science. Or as Homer would say, pie pants. A giant battle was a sign you were likely going to be one of the survivors. Um, Mike had seen a huge explosion from ships all till attacked, primarily ones carrying weapons or food to the Altarian resistance fighters. This only sounded the only sound he had heard was the one curse was one of his cursing under his breath. Talia Laris had claimed she never saw evidence of interstellar weapons used by Altil. She had seen footage of attacks, uh, but they were inconclusive according to her as to what had happened. She had hesitated to side with Mike even when confronted, likely out of fear and wanting to toe the party line. Unless she was shot at directly, she was unlikely to ever admit their supposed allies were in fact not their allies at all. The SS-210 is an impressive ship to anyone who's ever piloted it. That's actually a select few. There's actually a select few who even knew that Cordell Laris had drawn up the blueprints, which a manufacturing company had followed to the letter. The SS-210 is black in appearance and dark to radar as well. It had stealth that uh, a stealth, had stealth that even Alto would have difficulty breaking, especially in the void of deep space. It's armed with laser cannons, which are capable of taking down larger Altillian ships, thanks to their ability to break through defense shields. Altillian ships use defense shields at as any ship traveling through space for extended periods of time, and sometimes at great speeds, need to have. Any item, no matter how small, could be deadly when striking a small ship like this one. Shields use various ways to protect the ship. Altil ships use antimatter, which can neutralize any matter that touches it without any explosion or damage to the craft. It's a technology Falterius has yet to fully understand or master, yet this ship can break through such a defense. The lasers fired by SS-210 pulsate with variants of both matter and dark ma and antimatter, thus penetrating any shield that Altillian ships may use. The SS-210 doesn't just go all out with its guns. The black skin of the ship is also highly reflective, so much so that lasers hitting the SS-210 are often bounced right back into space. If enough lasers with enough force were to strike the same place at the same moment, it would break through the SS-210's shield, but it would likely take a well-planned attack or an extremely powerful laser no one has ever seen to make that happen. The ship has been tested extensively. Testing ended a mere week before Mike was handed his own ship to take, under the cover of night, to his local spaceport for safekeeping. His craft was one of 20 in existence, and now they were all escaping Falteris. Their invisibility to radar ensured they would get away without anyone taking much notice. More would be made, but with this, this was the extent of their force at this point in time. Mike pilots his ship away from Falteris with a smile on his face. He knows everything is going to be okay now. He has people behind him and that he believes in. He has his wife at his side. Yes, he's upset with the planet's decision to bow down to Altel's whims yet again, but progress has been made as his supporters are done with this regime. The space between Falteris and Temp is a short jump within the solar system, but would still take some time using standard travel methods. Mike presses a few buttons on the dashboard of his shiny black ship and then rests his hands behind his head as the ship does the rest. What's happening, Katie asks, as the ship fires a concentrated beam at a point in space. The point becomes a wormhole, and the ship quickly passes through it before the wormhole dumps him out on the other side at temp. The ship then fires a laser backward at the wormhole and wipes it out of existence. As proof, they're now dealing with technology Altel is going to have to respect. We're here, Katie asks, baffled by what just happened. Mike nods. A year ago, we developed the ability to send small ships through wormholes. It requires tremendous amounts of energy. I just exhausted our fuel cell with that jump, actually. We have to coast from here. It's a good thing we can coast a long way in space. Gotta love the no friction thing. Because science. But the planet's gravity will affect us, she points out. Mike's already pushing buttons on the dash again. He nods way ahead of you. 
This ship will use the, the planet's gravity to slingshot us to our destination. We'll get quite a, quite a bit of speed out of it, so find something to hold on to. We're already in a weightless environment, Mike. Holding on to something's a given. Very true, my lady, he says as he starts humming, trying to make adjustments to the angle of the ship's approach to ensure that they skip away from temp and not end up crashing with it. With a dead fuel cell, the shields have a small well of energy to draw on, but little else will work. Life support and cockpit controls are the only functioning parts of this state-of-the-art craft now. What are we riding in again? It's an SS-210. And what's that? It's a pretty cool spaceship. How did you get it? Ordered it from an Altillion store. They just take money and don't ask questions. Seriously? No, no. It was built by uh, Gill Manufacturing. I got this one made to me by uh, Cody Landers, uh, owner of the plant. They take such pride in their work, they all sign the bloody thing on the nose. This ship does things no Altillion would ever dream of, uh, dream one of their ships could do, and we have 20 of them. Who else has them? Mike pauses to recall as many as he can, though Katie won't know any of them. I know Dragston has one, though he said he doesn't intend to ever fly it. He's not really into the warship thing, which amazes me, considering what his people have been through. This is a warship? Any ship that can fly through interstellar, interstellar space is not allowed to be armed, according to the Treaty of Jernon. Jernon is the capital city of Fulteris. Mike winces. Why must our capital city ha have its name sullied by such a piece of filth as that? No, this ship is capable of inflicting damage, but it's only the beginning. A smile slowly crosses his face as the planet's gravity starts the slingshot process and they're hur hurtled toward Temp's moon Bryn. Uh, we're, ca we're crashing into Bryn, dear? It's the last thing they'd ever expect, he replies with the sarcasm she has come to expect at the worst possible times. He sees that look in her eye and decides it's a good time to tell the truth. There's something on Bryn that we're headed for. I'm not into the whole suicide dive thing, he says. He finds he's excited that he's fi that this is finally happening, and he can't keep himself from smiling, despite the circumstances surrounding this occasion. The moon gets bigger and finally fills their whole front view. As they get closer, they can see the icy structures on Bryn, which, which were explorers' homes, uh, where explorers built homes they'd intended to use later. The problem was they couldn't find a way to build something that would last on a moon that was regularly shaken violently by earthquakes. Bryn was made of ice and held loosely together, um with particles of iron, carbon, and sulfur that formed a primitive core. It was actually a very large comet which had been trapped uh, in orbit by temp thousands of years earlier and was being slowly ripped apart by the planet's gravity. The only inhabitants this moon had ever really known had been intelligent Altarians who had been forced to flee thanks to Altillian interference and a passive attitude on behalf of Altaris. Katie still thinks they're about to die until she sees something in the ice. There's a single door straight ahead from their position. As they grow closer, it's clear it's actually a docking bay, not a door as it appeared from further further out. She relaxed somewhat, though she felt they were still coming in too fast. That fear remained until she felt them slowing down gently. What's slowing us down? Mike smiles at her. When a ship's coming in from the depths of space like we are, it projects particles from its docking bay to slow the object to a safe distance for landing. Think of it as a man-made solar wind. Of course... If it's a hostile craft, it blows the damn thing away with more energy than most of our fleet has back home. It's actually a pretty cool setup. Okay, so what is this thing? It's the result of the Peace Restorer Civil Fund, Mike answers, giving all of its cash to a single project. This is likely going to be our home for a while until our planet learns to take its head out of its backside. That might take a while, sweetie, she answers. That's why I packed, he says, and he maneuvers the ship so that it enters the docking bay on the right right angle to land properly. The docking bay is on top of it. On, on top of what? Bryn isn't the surprise, I hope. A piece of ice being slowly ripped apart by temp isn't my idea of a nice home. Even if a base were made inside of it, it's still destined to be torn apart. Oh, it'll be torn apart, all right. Once the Altarian project fell apart, any idea of keeping this moon intact was dead. Almost as dead as the moon itself, Mike says, chuckling as the ship lands... And he gets uh, up from the cockpit. Gravity? She asks as she gets out of her harness and doesn't float in any di given direction. This moon has a small gravitational pull, but she should feel slightly lightheaded or at least light on her feet. She feels the same as she would on, on their home planet. Magnetic generator, first of its kind from Falteris actually, creates a magnetic field which simulates gravity. It's kind of a neat setup, one you'd better get used to. The, the, uh, those arcologies use something similar to create gravity in space, Smart setup for such an apparently primitive people. This is our new home, he says as he leads her through the docking bay and towards the door 
uh, into the unknown for Katie. W where is this, though? What's that humming noise, she asks. She should be comfortable since she's with Mike, and he's a man who'd never lead her into danger on purpose, but she can't escape a feeling of being trapped. The engines are clear in their throats. It's been amazing, really. The continuous earthquakes provided perfect cover for our operations here as we achieved a perfect balance in our construction. It's like ice sculpting, except we're putting something inside the ice instead of making a shape from the ice itself, he says with pride as he leads her through the door, which opens automatically and without any noise at all. So we're on a base then, she says, deciding to throw guesses out there since Mike was being evasive and cute over all the uncertainty. He shrugs. I guess you could say that. He leads her to a turbo lift elevator. It opens for them when they reach the door. It glows blue inside and the walls are see-through glass. Take me to the bridge, he says to the elevator. Bro voice print recognized. General Mike Translow, a male voice says, and the lift starts. Though it moves quickly, it doesn't generate a tremendous G-force for its occupants. Mike sees a confused look on his wife's face. Magnetic power is excellent. Uh, it provides, prevents motion sickness in the turbo lifts. I'd explain, but I don't fully understand it myself. Did this elevator just call you general? He laughs. Yeah, I guess it did. This is quite the smart elevator we have here. Bridge? She asks. Before he can answer, the turbo lift doors open and they're at the bridge. Before them is a large view screen. There are windows on each side, which only show the reflection of the lights off the ice outside. There is a crew of five on the bridge, and Katie doesn't know any of these people. Mike takes his place in a chair towards the back of the bridge and spins the chair to face his wife. We threw a lot of ideas around about how to design the bridge. We wanted to go with something new and fresh, but this just seemed like the best way to go. There's a reason ships have been designed this way for centuries. Katie leans back against a nearby wall. The light in the room comes from a blue glow within the ceiling, floor, and the walls themselves. This is beautiful, she says. The blue color everywhere, it's amazing. How does the lighting work? Mike smirks. The wall, floor, ceilings made of a frosted glass. The lights are behind it. The glass is actually resistant to pretty damn near anything, and it's just really another cool thing about this ship. So we're in a ship. Katie feels foolish for not having figured it out before being told. Mike turns to his first officer. That's why we're on a bridge. Uh, Lieutenant, let's break out of the ice, shall we? Mike, am I going to hear bad comedy the entire trip? The officer replies. First, I'm not Mike anymore. You can call me General. Second... Yes, there will be plenty of bad comedy, and you're going to learn to like it. Super. General, the officer says, and he takes a seat at the helm. He then proceeds, uh, he then starts the process which, which brings the ship roaring to life. Katie takes the only open seat in the room, one near the back, which appears to be for a navigator, as it has a 3D map of Bryn and Temp, as well as traffic uh, in their area. Most of the traffic's freight vessels and pleasure cruises that take people past Temp's icy moon. She looks over at Mike. Is it legal for you to have helped build this in the middle of Temp's moon? Mike turns to face her, smiling again. Well, the entire moon's going to break up in a few centuries anyway. We're just helping it along the way, and Temp doesn't really care since we're going to do something pretty damn spectacular here. Their planet gets new rings out of it anyway. Just sit back and enjoy the show, sweetie. Cracking noises are heard from outside the ship as the hull strains, against the frozen water encasing it. The ship's engines then push the ship upwards. The movement of the engines as they turn from, from a back-facing position to a down-facing one breaks ice and causes large banging noises to be heard inside the ship as it shudders. It then jolts upward and the windows suddenly no longer face the ice. Out the windows to the left, one can now see temp, and to the right, they can see double suns of the system. This is now past the point of no return. How big is this ship actually? Katie asks, aware no one's listening to her in the midst of this amazing show going on. The ship continues its upward movement until it is hovering over what is now a broken and very unstable moon. It turns and faces Bryn, showcasing a large hole it created when the icy surface, uh, where the icy surface was once perfectly round and pristine, save for the lines formed by geological activity due to Temp's gravitational pull, which is known for causing tourists to marvel. The shine from its surface is clearly visible to the people of Temp, and now that perfect white surface has been compromised. Many on the planet below expected this, just not in such a violent and planned manner. Okay, let's finish the job, guys, Mike says. The ship hums as it powers up a weapon system the likes of which the galaxy hasn't seen outside of an Altillion ship or two. Even the greatest ships would have a hardest time uh, competing with the firepower that this was about to display. The ship fires a series of laser blasts, carefully placed to shutter, shatter the moon into pieces, which would eventually form rings around Temp. Tourists love planetary rings. 
Katie can hardly believe what she's watching through the view screen, expecting it to be something from a video game. Maybe she's sleeping and having a vivid dream, which goes on for days at a time. Mike turns and faces her again. Bryn is now a tourist trap for temp, and they'll thank us for it. Bryn was a dead, dead world soon enough anyway. How? The energy of our double sun. The ship actually captures it and focuses it. We use that energy to pull Bryn into pieces that would be taken into a stable orbit of their world, which is actually what they wanted anyways. We agreed to make it happen in exchange for being allowed to construct this ship within the moon itself. Mike says, uh, rubbing the rest armrests of his dark blue chair. What's the name of the ship, she asks. Uh, Mike chuckles. You know, it was hard to come up with a name, so I went with the irony. This, my dear, is the Peace Restorer. This ship is sleek, capable of battling anything which the Altillion forces can throw at us. It also has the ability to do this, he says and nods at the first officer. He's like a kid with a new toy. The Peace Restorer emits four beams from four corners of the ship. They focus on one point in space. Their energy causes uh, the fabric of time and space to open into a wormhole. The Peace Restorer then heads straight for it while Katie's watching in shock. It's a whole new galaxy, is all she can manage to say. That's the end of that one. There you go. Just straight through. And and wormholes are the only way to do that without having the time dilation. That's the, the reason I went with that, because time dilation is a thing, and you have the, the warping of space with Star Trek, which in theory works, but I went with wormholes, because sure, why not? Because if I went with warp factors, then ta-da, Star Trek. So, yeah, no. Uh, there you go. Uh, we will finish up the book uh, next time out, and then that'll be it for the reading portion of things. Uh, Yvonne will then be acting out the book in its entirety. So, um, <laughs> it should be good. I've just got to find laser guns and a moon that we can blow up, and then we're good. Uh, there and and the part where the peace restorer is revealed, uh, the peace restorer I came up with when I was twelve, and it was with the idea that this is a war that had been going on for a very long time. The peace restorer was to end it. The idea that this massive ship that was just absolutely you know devastating in its firepower could just put an end to it. It was it was the ultimate. Uh, weapon against a, a pretty evil villain so i wanted it to to feel sleek and and futuristic in its appearance and in its descriptions and and still match with the rest of the stuff i've been saying about about mike and his people so he'd, he'd rather not blow things up but he's gonna sort of kind of have to sort of do it so there you go uh the peace restorer is born and that was always my favorite favorite ship and with, with Altel, I had their initial ship was called the Unstoppable, was the name of their, because again, I was 12. So bear with me. That was the name I came up with for that. And then that got blown up. And and by the time I was done with the original series of books, I think I was on like Unstoppable 7 or something. It was a, and when I think back now, I'm like, you know what? It was clearly highly stoppable. And they should have just called it kind of Unstoppable. Maybe Stoppable. And why are we still doing this? Should have been what the seventh one was called. So, anyways, there you go. Uh, thank you guys so much for all your support. Uh, thanks, Bear, for, for being entertaining and for... Uh, she, she likes story she time, too. She decided I needed to hold her. You yeah. see, she hopped down and then went right here and just... Yeah, she's 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 we very much like, Excuse me. liking story time. So, there you go. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I'm not going to ask people to like and subscribe, but it's because it's a weird part to do that. Stay home, stay safe, and take care. I will talk to you again soon.